this is um, definitely a beginner's level workshop and we will be covering um, a bunch um, today and I'm going to move quickly so that we have time for everything as well as to move on to the next presentation. So during, um, during the presentation, if you have questions, definitely drop them in the chat box um, and we'll keep an eye on it so that we can get through the slides and then there's uh, also space at the end to do some questions and sharing um, because as uh, Dr. Brother Pastor Heber said, um, we all have wisdom, we all, um, we, we have a little bit of everything and all together we're gonna create this garden that we wanna grow. Um, next slide, please. You can skip to the, the skip the the next slide to the next slide. There we go. You already heard that. That's me. So today we are going to cover why do we garden? Um, some tips and tricks for getting started at home. Troubleshooting common problems that you may come across, and then as I said, questions and sharing. Next slide. There we go. Um, so this is the long version of a quote that's circulated often throughout the Black Church Food Security Network. Whoever controls the food controls the people. But why I included this slide in particular, you okay? Okay. Um, is because it also, it breaks it out to, it says who controls the food supply controls the people. Who controls the energy can control whole continents, and who controls money can control the world. And that comes from uh, Henry Kissinger, which, you know, all of these people who have said great things have some complex histories. But what I really thought was important to share about this is that food is only mentioned in the first part, but food is also used, or food crops, food stuffs are used to create energy as well as when you grow your own food, you're growing your own money. So let's move on to the next slide. Uh-oh, to the, to the right. <laughs> okay, cool. So like I said, money don't grow on trees, but it definitely grows some seeds. So I have a little chart here on the right side. It really just describes for me uh, why, we, why do we garden? Why do we grow our food? Why is it important? And it's all about this relationship between uh, the value, the price, and the impact of your food operation. So what do I mean by that? So when you're growing your own food and we think about, we think about impacts of the food system, period. So we're in a time crazy right now where um, there are food shortages in the grocery store. There is uncertainty as to if farmers are going to be able to uh, produce the yields that supply our, our grocery stores with food because certain things like feed stock for animals is becoming more difficult to uh, access. Seeds are becoming more difficult to access. Um, Inputs like energy, so folks have been having um, electricity shortages. So these big factory farms that are kind of automated and utilize a lot of technology and, um, and electricity are feeling threatened right now because of all of the kind of chaos and just disruption that's happening in the world. And so when you bring it back home to yourself and thinking about the impact of our, our, our external food system, you can also bring it back to say the impact of the difference between organic food and you know conventionally raised food that's full of pesticides and herbicides and that has uh, has depleted the soil and the earth. So that impact is you know it goes to um, the taste, the the growing practices, the accessibility of it all. Um, that price. Why do we garden? Because. Things like asparagus, which you plant one time and it comes back over and over again, those perennial crops um, that will cost you over a lifetime pennies on the dollar for every stalk of asparagus that you harvest is costing you four dollars, five dollars, six dollars, seven dollars at the at the grocery store, at the local farmers markets. And so when you're growing your own food, you are offsetting your living costs um, as well as adding that security within to your, uh, within to yourself and your household that you all are not relying on external sources for how you eat, 
Um, and then the value, the multiplier effect of that is not only again when you when you're going to the grocery store, if you're like me. Um, and you're looking at prices and you're looking at that unit cost of, of an item versus the the, t the like the price that's on there and you see that it costs 38 cents per unit etc cetera, etc cetera. when you're uh, that is like the value of that product that's how you can determine you can compare value of this over that and so when you put that back into the food that you're growing What's the value, what's the unit cost of growing your own collard greens, for example, that you can harvest every week, one plant, leave it in the ground, it's still there over winter, it comes back in the spring, you know, um, versus every time you want collard greens. You wait till they on sale, till they 99 cents a pound, and sometimes they two ninety nine a bunch for the organic ones. Um, and so thinking about, uh, again, how do we make that dollar stretch, but then what are the multipliers of growing our own food? How does it affect our well-being that we are putting our hands in the soil and getting grounded? How uh, that we're taking the time to kind of relax um, and be outside, get that good vitamin D that you need for strong lung health. Um, and so when we, when we talk about gardening, there's so much richness and value to the activity that goes even beyond the financial and the, the, uh, the physical health benefits of growing your own food. Next slide, please. Okay, so let's get into it. And is that, I don't know how we got that little um, scribbly on the screen. I'm like, where'd that come from? Um, okay, so choosing what to grow. They These are three kind of, things that I look at when I am choosing what to grow in my garden. And this also goes for if you're trying to grow crops to sell them, it's kind of the same thing. <laughs> so first, number one, grow what you eat. Um, it is a waste, a terrible waste to, you know, uh, to just put seeds in the ground. And because it was interesting, you like the colors on the seed packet. Um, there is a research component to, to growing food that, you know, is that I personally love. It's exciting to kind of put new seeds in and see what comes up. But when you're thinking about growing at home and going back to those, you know, benefits that we just talked about, you definitely want to grow what you eat, what your household eats, or if your neighbors, working with your neighbors and your family members to grow a little bit of what they would even consider um, to be tasty so that you all can barter and trade. Um, growing what you can. So I have a chart here on the left, and this is for the state of Maryland. Um, there's a link for the full chart at the end of the presentation and we can um drop those links in the chat box as well um at the end but this is our planting calendar and so this is a really great calendar it's kind of boring to look at but i'll just go over it i know it's really small um perhaps on your screen but the colors at the top um are a code for you to read how to read those bars and on the left column it has everything that um is generally viable to grow in the state of maryland and this is just an excerpt from the list it goes on for pages um, and then beside it, it has the days to germination, which we'll talk about, and the days to harvest or maturity, which again, we'll also talk about. And then on that right side of the chart, it has the months of the year. And you probably have seen this. Um, and those different colors are telling you when to start the seeds indoors, when to um, move them outside, or when to kind of harden them up if they, for the, uh, it says for the different temperatures here. It also will tell you um, for the, it tells you like the orange is warm weather crops. And then red is when it is like very hot outside. So you want it. So there are crops and there's seasonality and we'll talk about that. So growing what you can means growing what, um, paying attention to the seasons paying attention to uh, what inputs you have, so what type of soil you have, um, where will you be pos positioning this? So if you're growing in containers, you know, do you have a good sunny spot? If you, uh, if you have grown outside in your backyard, is there any tree cover? Is there um, a, a cat nearby? Or do you have like rabbits or things like that that are going to disrupt certain root crops? And just thinking about like what, what do you have the accessibility to grow? Um, and then the 
The last one, you can tell that I am really about the money. I, I'm all about the money. So grow, when you're thinking about prioritizing, especially when you have kind of um, small growing space and you're thinking, well, I maybe can't grow 50 crops, but I can grow two or three, then definitely put higher on your list what is cheaper to grow than to buy in a store and also what is tastier to grow than what's in the store. And a really big example of that is fresh tomatoes, particularly the heirloom varieties. Um, I do not, I'm one of those people, I do not like tomatoes unless it's in the summer when they are coming straight off of somebody's vine because they're sweeter, they're prettier to look at, they have a longer shelf life. Um, to me, there's a better value in buying and eating seasonal tomatoes versus going to the store and getting those little light pink tomatoes that there are there are pink tomatoes but the ones in the store are supposed to be red and we don't want those um so that's that's a that's a real benefit and value to like growing your own next slide and again if you have any questions drop them in the chat awesome okay so then next um, the really big, a really big thing, and I wanted, I put a whole slide dedicated in here. I'm sorry that it's a little bit funny. Um, but go to like planting your garden, choosing what seeds to grow, um, choosing what crops to grow all starts with your seeds. So pay, uh, Paying attention to your seeds, taking care of your seeds is crucial. You can't, I'm not going to say you can't grow nothing without a seed, but nothing grows unless it came from the seed. Um, and so a few things to pay attention to. So I have a picture here of a seed packet front and back. And on the front of this seed, I see a USDA organic label. I see, um, it says cool season, 65 days. Um, it's an heirloom seed. That's on the front. On the back, it has all types of information. And so when you're, uh, and we'll talk about this as we get into troubleshooting issues, but so many of our issues can be alleviated if we just read our seed packet. So seed packets are kind of like reading the back of a wine bottle. Like it'll tell you what flavors you can expect. It'll tell you how long to age it. You know, it'll tell you um, where, where that seed is kind of coming from. Um, and so there are different seed types. And as you're, as you get your seeds from the seed bank, you want to just pay attention to them. Or even if you, um, and, and all seeds can be used, but they're just, as you're reading it, um, you may see some differences. So these seeds that we have here on the left are both organic and heirloom, which means that they were grown at a certified organic facility, and then heirloom seeds have been passed through generation. So one of the heirloom seed varieties that we have here that a good brother of ours who will be on a later series is fish peppers. Um, and so there's a gentleman up in Pennsylvania who found uh, fish pepper seeds from an, from an old family member and hadn't really known it before, grew it and saved it and has started to circulate it around that we have this uh, local variety of peppers, fish peppers that are really delicious. Um, and our brother Xavier makes a really delicious hot sauce from them. Um, but they are, they are seeds that have been passed down through like the traditional methods of uh, growing food, keeping seeds, and passing them to your children. Um, and and on that note, um, that is part of your legacy. Like growing is part of our legacy as Black people in this country, but also how we pass it on. In the same way that you are passing on, um, that you want to pass on homes and money and bonds and stocks and all of that, passing on seeds to the future generations uh, will keep us sustained just as much as our financial assets do. So hybrid seeds um, have been spliced together um, through natural selection. So there are like GMO seeds, which have done like a, um, that have been spliced together in a lab by inserting certain parts of DNA from one plant to another to make it more resilient or drought hardy or whatever. Now hybrid seeds, if you see them, they may also be labeled as S1 seeds. And they have been cross-pollinated to enhance the benefits of the crop. And a, a really interesting thing about that is that it's most likely, like I said, going to try to uh, reduce its pest, uh, uh, increase its pest resilience, 
um, increases, uh, uh, I'm blanking on the word, hardiness, I guess, to drought is a, or cold or heat. Um, but flavor is not really like super high up there. So when you're trying to pick seeds for like what's going to be the best to eat for you at home, hybrid seeds are really good if you are uh, growing seeds for market, growing crops for market because you know they have more uniform crops. They um, are a little bit more resistant or resilient. But when you're talking about growing at home and growing for taste, uh, heirloom seeds are a good choice. Um, but you also can kind of create your own heirloom and hybrid varieties by this last one, the open pollinators, um, which will grow the same variety every time with a caveat as long as it's not too close to another um, another variety of the same type of plant. So this seed packet here is for beets. If we allow these beets to stay in the ground and um, and go to seed and put you know put their their flowers up, and there was so these beet blends has Chioga beets, Detroit red beets. Um, golden beets, um, and I think I think that's it. This one. So if I put this, um, if I put this mix to all in the same row together, and I allow them all to go to seed, and if I I saved those seeds, my next crop will also be a mix of all of these beets, but they also may include some version of these. Uh, beet varieties mixed together because um, they are an open pollinator seed type. And I'm not reading that on the label. That is just an example. Um, the contrary to that is like a closed pollinator or self-pollinating plant, which is a little bit easier to grow because you don't need um, pollinators, which are things like bees, butterflies, birds, the wind, um, to make the plant grow. It, it's more self-sufficient. But the, the kind of offset or the shadow of that is that your those seeds are not able to be saved as easily. But again, if you grow a couple generations of a seed, you it starts to take on the adaptability of your climate, of your experience. And so all of this can kind of be worked out. Now, common words to look out for on the back of your seed packet. Um, on this seed packet, it says days to emerge. It may also say days to germinate. That just means how long is it going to take from when you put the seed in the ground to when you can see that it was a viable seed and it pops up its first um, set of leaves. Seed depth is how, um, how deeply you should put your seed in the soil that you're planting it in. Um, a rule of thumb for that is you want to put it twice as deep as the size of the seed. So for things like mustard seeds or any of the brassica family that are really, really small, you just want to just lay them on top of the soil and allow the water to depress them into the soil so that they are getting enough um, heat and water and, and all the things um, that they are not too deep for them, for those little first little baby, baby leaves to pop up, that they're uh, uh, emerging underneath the soil. Seed spacing tells you um, how far apart to plant your seed. So for this, it says a group of three seeds every four inches. So you're going to uh, four inches, a kind of rule of thumb is take your fit. Um, and this width here between your uh, pointer finger and your pinky is about three to four inches. So if you are planting in a row, that's a good way to like, just press your finger down and put it on either one or, well, for this, it said three seeds. So in this period, you will put three seeds here, kind of evenly spaced out in that four inch space. Treated seeds um, mm -hmm. means that they have been treated with some type of something to protect it. So it's most likely going to be like a, a pesticide or herbicide, but there are also uh, seeds that come kind of, coated that can be like an organic coating, but that's just what that means, that there's something additional on the seed to help increase its ability to go from seed to plant. Um, thinning means, thinning means, um, actually, I will show you what thinning means. <laughs> so I have a little uh, seed here I'll use in a demonstration, but thinning means once you put your seeds in, so these beets say three every four inches. 
And then it says thin to one every four inches. So once you put your seeds in, you're going to see, you're going to put them in. And the reason why you plant more seeds than you uh, expect to have viable crops is because seeds have a germination rate also. And that may also be on the back of your packet. It may say something like 85%. It may say something like 60%. That means that 85% of those seeds you can expect to germinate. So when you're putting your seeds in, you want to make sure that you have put enough in that you're going to get those viable uh, crops without um looking like well what happened i put the seed in there but i don't i don't really know um so when you thin it you can just go through and i'll show i'll do a demonstration later on of how to thin and keep the uh keep the plants that you're thinning but you also sometimes you have to thin them and they you know give them back to the earth give them to the compost pile um depending on how many you have Lot number in pack four season will just tell you if you have an issue with disease, if you have an uh, issue, it said it had an 85% germination rate and only, you know, uh, 10 out of 80 of your seeds came up or 10 out of 100 of your seeds and that's a 10% germination rate. Um, then you can send, you know, you can reach back out to that company and say, hey, these seeds at so-and-so, such and such. It also protects you, again, if you're growing for a market um, and anybody of your um get sick from something that you're having you and it and you know it wasn't you you got your good practices going on then you can also trace that back to where it came from um so it's just a way it's and that's a safety precaution packed for season tells you um when that seed came out, I see some conversation going around about viability of seeds. So the packed for season, it'll tell you this one says it was packed for 2015. So if I come back in 2020 and try to plant these seeds, I could potentially plant these seeds. However, the germination rate of seeds goes down every year, even if you are keeping them um, well, you you know, you're keeping them in a nice, cool, well aerated place. They haven't gotten wet. Um, they haven't been exposed to sunlight. Even when you're doing Doing that your seeds are just there growing older however when you do those things you extend the, the life of your seeds exponentially so that just lets you know when you're getting a seed packet as you get your seeds from the seed bank um, you'll see kind of what year it was packed for and that just helps you to gauge a little bit for this particular seed packet if it told me to plant three seeds per four inches and it was packed in 2015 I may put maybe five or six seeds per four inches to increase my rate of getting the, the right amount of beets come up so that I can plant them and eat from them um, and then direct sow versus transplanting um, beets are a direct sow thing I've also seen them transplanted but that, that just means that you can either put it you can put it directly in the soil and expect it to grow straight from that and it'll be um, it's a quick growing crop versus transplanting there are some crops that you would probably want to transplant um a thing like a um a, a thing like tomatoes which these were started from seed but it's going to take forever for these tomatoes to grow they are 76 days to harvest um these particular ones so that's just the difference between that um, and great, great, great dialogue in the chats. Um, next slide, please. Yes, shout out to Brother Chris. Um, okay, so I've been talking about seeds, 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 but like I said, you can grow without seeds and i've been seeing a lot of videos a lot of people have been circulating videos around you know how to uh kitchen garden or refrigerator garden um and it's absolutely possible um you all are seeing photos this is actually my mother's project so she had she going back to grow what you want to eat so she is an avid eater of celery so that's what you're looking at and the picture on the left um, is of her starting her celery um, plants. And so what she did was when she got her celery, she cut it off, she put it submerged it in water, and then this one with the white pot on the right um, is like she just put it in there, and then they grow in maturity as you go to the left in this little small kind of thumbnail picture. And then this larger picture that you see, she has now transplanted them into the growing media. Um, and so one of my friends was here this morning, um, and she said, well, how do I know when to transplant a thing? How do I know, especially when you're propagating, because that's what this is, so you're propagating. And I have... I have some little house plants here that I'm propagating too that has some um, 
roots on them now after I just put the little cutting in the water. So this is kind of where you go to that. And I, you know, I am like a master. I would talk about this over and over again to trust your internal wisdom and trust the wisdom that's coming to you from your ancestor and from the soil. So when you uh, go to transfer your plants, you definitely want to make, so this is a good plant. It's ready to be put in soil. It has enough kind of root stock that if I planted it, the roots would be able to take up enough nutrients from the soil to get it going versus uh, just being in this water and I'm feeding it uh, like a little bit of sugar, or a little bit of plant food every once in a while. So you just want to make sure that those plants have some good root stock on them before you plant them. Um, and then especially with these, like the really great indicator was what type of leaf activity did it have? So that's, and some easy ones to grow are there. You can see it. Um, if you have suggestions for other easy kind of refrigerator uh, props to grow, definitely drop it in the um, in the chat box for other people to see. My favorite are probably potatoes. Um, I'm gonna tell y'all a little secret. I'm not supposed to eat potatoes, but when I do eat potatoes, I prefer to eat new potatoes straight out the ground than from the grocery store because they're just like they are smoother. Um, they are they you know they're not as like kind of chalky as those kind of Idaho Westerns can be. I I feel like I don't know I don't like them, but, but the they're buttery. Um, and then the skin is, is also easier to take in. So that's one of my favorite things. Um, I'm not sure what that question says, uh, Monique. Um, my bad. Um, so I'm going to keep going. But if you can clarify what A S asterisk means, then I might be able to answer. Um, next slide. Huh? I, I think I see it. It says, do onions work the same way as propagating celery? Ah, okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Yes. So especially with the scallions, with onions, you honestly don't need to, like with bulb onions, you don't really need to um, put them in water first. Your onions are going to tell you when they need to go on the ground. So all of them onions that you have thrown away maybe in your life that have those little green sprouts shot, um, shooting out the top. Um, that tells you when your onion is good to go in. And so a lot of the times um, when that happens, the onion will start to become soft and it may have like some type of mold or like moisture or something in between the rings. So you want to peel all of that off, um, all of the, the external um, off and then put that root side down in the soil and allow the rest of it and a new onion will grow around, around that ball. Um, that is also how onions come, like when you are buying them, you know, just the plant, they'll, you can either buy them as onion sets, which you'll, you may see in some of your um, seed stores, or onion seeds. And I would say um, onions is never a thing you should grow from seed. It just takes entirely too long. Um, so starting onions from established onions, garlic is the same way. Once it starts to shoot up that little, that little uh, sprout, peel away, um, peel away the, the external and pop the, the root side, that kind of hard nub at the bottom down into the soil. Um, again, not too deep. You want to just put it in just where that, uh, that green starts to come up. You want that to be at the top of the soil and all of the onion bulb to be underneath. Um, next slide, please. The, the root part. Okay, great. Did we, did we get the answer to that? The green part should be above the soil. The everything else should be beneath the soil. Okay, so now that we know what seeds we're growing, what crops we're growing, we we are all excited about doing it. Let's gather our materials. So I have um, I have some of my materials on the table here for y'all to see. The pictures that you see, obviously, we have the seedling mix, which um, is from my house. This picture on the side here, I just typed in um, garden and starter pack. Um, and that came up. This picture is actually from Amazon. It's a 20 piece set and it has that spade, um, which is this first thing on the left. Then it has the, the planting knife, 
um, which depending on your planting knife, this one doesn't look particularly sharp, but depending on your planting knife, you can also use it as a harvesting knife. But it just tells you it has like little grades on it. Um, when you're talking about transplanting in particular, it'll tell you transplant four inches deep, transplant nine inches deep, something like that. So this, this particular tool has um, kind of like your mason jar or your measuring cup, it has those make measuring lines on it. So when you stick it down in the soil, you know exactly how far you're planting your plant your crop down. Um, this the next tool is for weeding. Um, the next two, this one, this little hand rake is a cultivator tool. The one right beside is like a little hand pitchfork, which I thought was super cute, but not necessarily uh, not necessary. Um, you have the snips, a gardening bag, gardening gloves. These two small things, I'm not sure if you can see them, but the one on the left is a, a, a soil moisture um, a kind of thermometer. And so if you stick it down in your soil, it'll tell you um, exactly how much water you have in your pot. And that comes really in handy when you're talking about container gardening, because containers can dry out easily. When a plant is in the ground, it is able to pull up like more groundwater, is able to pull up water that's uh, further out and the roots can kind of do what it does to find what it needs. But when you're planting in a container, things you have to be careful about is making sure that your plant is not sitting water and it's not drying out too quickly especially during those summer months when it gets hot um, the next tool that's there which is really cool is a seed separator so if you are like my friend who threw these seeds in here because she couldn't figure out uh, they was too small um, a seed a, a seeder a little handheld seeder will help you with that because you can set it to the distance that you want the seed to come out in um, and there are also like large tools that you can use if you're planting um, in the ground you have your seeds your, your plant labels which I think are very important I forgot to put that on my list a water bottle for spraying down your leaves or spraying plant food like I have here I have this is a worm worm compost and water um, that I can spray on my plants. And then these little butterfly mm. things are to attract pollinators to your plants. So, <laughs> uh oh, she texted me, you mad. <laughs> I can't see it though. Um, so, so um, the essential essentials for me are the trowel, which I have my little bag here. I got my hand trowel. Um, a little small cultivator tool, which will help you when you. I, I mean, I grow in ground, so this is fine, a fine size, but you could also, like for plants, you could use a fork, you know, like your thinking cap is the last thing on the list because there is so, uh, there are so many things in your home already that you can use. Uh, when we're, you know, getting on a new hobby, we love to go out and buy a whole bunch of stuff, but you don't have to buy nothing. I'm pretty sure everything that you need is already in your home. Um, you may need to buy one or two things. Like I just bought this seedling mix because I was starting seedling um, from home and it, it's really important um, to have uh, see, I, I really wanted to have a seedling mix because seedling mix has a um, smaller particle size than potting mix. So if you look at the difference, and I don't know, this is my potting mix that is really big. Uh-oh. Can y'all see me? Uh, I think you froze up just a little bit. We can still hear you. Okay. Hold on. Let me change it. Let me fix it. I'm trying to show stuff like you it, can't even see. It, it froze with your mouth wide open. Look at you. You just froze. Oh, there you go. Oh, you bad. <laughs> oh, no. Um, so that's the poll that's going around. That is so cute. I love it. Um, yeah, so a seedling mix has a, has just a smaller particle size, and that is really helpful to seed so that when you go back to that seed depth conversation, when you talk about seed moisture, and what seedlings really need in their earliest stage of life is moisture and heat. Um, sunlight will come later, but as long as it's in a spot where it can get that humidity that it needs, that's what's really going to make the seeds pop open. It's also why you will see for certain seeds to soak them in water for a few hours, soak them in water overnight um, so that that water can really permeate because just like with propagation, water is the first thing um, that we need. That's the first thing I do in the morning. Plants are no different. Um, so the seedling mix, your seeds, your potting mix, your pots, your containers, um, and some plant food, like we said, 
and then you are good to go. Don't underestimate your internal wisdom. Don't underestimate the wisdom of your friends and family. Um, even if they're not actively growing, I'm pretty sure all of us know somebody that has grown something in their lifetimes. Um, so next slide, please. Okay, so common problems. Next slide. Okay, so on the left is not necessarily a problem slide. That is actually what can happen when we um, when we solve for our problems. I'm sorry, this is so small. Over and underwater, we already talked about. Pro tip here: line the bottom of your pot with small rocks if you're planning to. Um, planning to plant in a container. And what that's going to do is it's going to encourage your drainage. Same thing with house plants. If you've been growing house plants, it'll uh, make it easy for you, for your plant to um, have a pool of water at the bottom of it so that you don't have to check on it as much. And it, it has more of the tools that it needs. So in a pot like this, um, I have this pot here. I just, this says it's two, uh, two to 2.5 gallons. It has a little ridge right here at the bottom. I would put, I would fill that up with, uh, with like gravel or like a, a medium particle, um, particle size rock, cover that up and then put my soil in and then put my plants in. So then again, I don't have to do as much work and I'm more closely mm -hmm. mirroring the, uh, external environment that these would normally be growing in. Too much, not enough sunlight, same thing. Um, just pay attention. Growing on patios or any type of cement surface, you have to pay attention to um, because that cement is multiplying the effect of the of the sun. And so, again, you have to really pay attention to your plants that they're not drying out, especially in times of drought. Um, moving them around, kind of uh, mirroring the movement of the sun like if the if you have a spot that's sunny all day long and your plants need um a few hours of shade then you can move those those pots yourself especially if you're growing in containers if you are growing in beds and you can't move you're not as mobile with your plants then just uh just pay attention so that's kind of like the first step in the scientific process go way go way back to elementary school when we learned about the scientific method um observation is the first step so paying attention to where you're going to put your plants before you put them out there uh will help you exponentially because you're going to see what type of sunlight it gets when it rains does the rain actually hit that area um when the shade comes how long is the shade out there um are there again are there like little animals are there cats and stuff that are kind of tracing through where you intend for it to be all of those types of things are going to come in handy if you just observe your environment first um too many seeds or plants in the pot that's an easy fix um but just as a rule of thumb when you're planting in a container there is a such thing as stretching the limits of what the seed packet says that it can actually do. So I have this book here, uh, Square Foot Gardening. And if you can see from the front, he has things in here that say they're supposed to be spaced a foot apart and they're spaced like four inches apart. So it's a, it's a great thing to put multiple crops in a, um, in a container. You just have to make sure that the spacing is good and if you're going to condense the spacing, then you have to pay extra attention to the nutrients that those plants are getting. So that, that's something that you got to make sure your soil is super good or you're feeding those plants with, a, with, a, um, with an organic fertilizer that you either make at home or that you purchase. Um, okay, I thought that was me. <laughs> um, yeah, so with that being said, your seed packet will tell you plant, um, it, you know, it'll, we already went over it. It'll say how, what space to put the seeds, what space to put the plants. Um, once you thin it out, you can just expand it to different pots like we're going to do. Uh, plant is growing flowers. Uh, y'all are, are hip, y'all already know. If your plant is growing flowers, it's not supposed to be a flowering plant. There are two ways that a plant is growing flowers, when it's about to produce fruit or when it's about to go to seed. So when your tomato plants get those little yellow flowers on it, that's an excellent sign. You want those flowers to come. That's where your tomatoes are coming from. When your um, broccoli plant starts to get those yellow flowers, that means that your broccoli is old and it's about to go to seed. Now you got two options at that time. You can uh, just pop off that little top and give the plant uh, some more 
life by sending all the nutrients that it was going to put into its seeds back into the plant, or you can allow it to stay there and then you can let let that whole process go through, allow it to dry out, and then right before they would drop on the ground, you want to go and collect those seeds. So you you have options, but that is not a it's not a, a issue. Um, that's a really good sign. Your seeds not coming up. Um, that's that germination. So what type of seeds were they? How, how long have they been in this packet? Um, did they get wet before you planted them? Um, did they get enough moisture when you planted them? So I have here, um, and Josie is going to cover this more, but I have here an egg carton that I started some seedlings and I made a little germination chamber. And it's really, um, I put it right in my old eggs with my little seeds in it. And as you can see, I did this about three days ago. And I have some of my seeds popping and some of them not. Um, and so to me, I'm like, well, I knew there was old seed when I put it in there. I was just testing it out, doing some experimentation. And so I feel really good about how many um, starts that I have popping up. But putting them in this egg, egg container gave me an opportunity to water them one time and then do evaporation and cond uh, condensation, they are watering themselves until they're ready to be transplanted or ready to be taken out of this container so they can grow up a little bit bigger. And these seeds right here were pak choy, which is like bok choy. So it was a really small seed. Um, so I feel really good about that. Um, leaves turning yellow can be... Uh, it's like a nutrient thing. Is it not getting enough water? Is it not getting enough food? And pests taking over my plants, um, much like us right now in the age of Corona, um, it is not, by the time you are applying something topical, it's almost too late, right? So it's just like by the time we're taking medicine for issue, we already have the disease. What we want to be doing is that preventative. <laughs> so has taken over your plants um, and, and also can be something connected to your soil. So if you are like me and you like to reuse soil, you don't want to reuse soil that had pests in it or mold in it or anything like that because that can live in your soil. So those, that type of soil, just toss it out. Um, and um, Michael can talk, say more uh, about if you can put that on a compost pile. There are some things you can put in your compost. I think those types of things, though, by the heat of the process will be um, – will be taken care of, but you don't want to directly take contaminated soil and put it in new um, new plants because that's going to give you disease or make your plants susceptible to pests. Um, another thing that you can do to alleviate this, and I didn't really um, I didn't really expand on this at all in this presentation, but companion planting is another thing. So one thing that I love to do is plant my collards next to onion and garlic because I know that the onion and garlic is going to send out some signals to all the little things that want to eat my collard greens and put them, put them in a, a really good position. So there are, there are certain crops that really like to be next to each other, and there are certain crops that don't like to be next to each other. General rule of thumb, don't plant the same uh, family of plant next to each other because of the, the type of pests uh, that are attracted to a collard green is also going to be attracted to a kale plant. So you don't want to plant them too close together in your garden. The same thing with tomatoes and peppers. Um, they are susceptible to the same type of pest. You want to space them out, even with your containers or in your um, in your in-ground bed. Um, I can drop a link to uh, like some infographics around what other plants might be next to each other. But just a general, um, a general, Thing you can do is just search companion planting and so many things will come up. Um, borage, borage and cucumbers, is, and borage and potatoes is another one. Um, green beans and um, what would I like to plant next to my green beans? I want to say beets. Um, but any of the legumes go next to things that are uh, suck a lot of energy out of soil. All of your fruiting plants are going to suck a lot of energy out of your soil. They're going to eat up a lot of nutrients. Um, and it's tomato and basil. That's a really great one. Um, and so you can, this goes for like, what do you put after another one? So you can reuse soil. So if I put tomatoes in a bed one time, I'm not about to turn around and put eggplant in that same bed because the, the soil is stressed out, it's struggling. So I want to put something like a bean or a pea that's going to uh, return some of those nutrients back to that soil before I can put another like high, um, high energy crop in that same place. Um, next slide. 
Okay, and um, I'm just going to do a quick demonstration of how to thin. The question that was here was, did I do this right? So I have a, a tomato plant, and they are looking really good. They're starting to get a little leggy, just a little bit, but they're still pretty tender. And so what I want to do here, and I'm going to move my laptop, I'm going to thin these plants so that they have enough room to continue on with their lives. So right now, this seed packet says that we want to start indoors. Well, light an area six to eight weeks before planting outdoors. We want to sow seeds a quarter of an inch deep into individual containers filled with seed starting formula. Keep moist, seedlings emerge in seven to 10 days. So that has definitely happened. And then this says it's container friendly, but we're going to plant one plant per 24 inch container. And again, we can definitely stretch the limits on, on our plants if we take care of the soil, make sure that they're water, make sure that they get uh, the sun that they need, but we still don't want to stretch it too much. So right now we probably have about uh, maybe 15 viable seedlings in here. And so I'm going to try to save as many of these as possible by transferring them to different containers. So I have some pots here. This is, and when they talk about the size of the pot, they're talking about this right here. So they're talking about the diameter of this pot. So this pot just as an eyeball is probably about a 10 to 12 inch pot. This is, no, this is not a 12 inch pot. This is certainly like a, a 10 inch pot right here. So I'm going to move, I'm probably going to put two plants in here. And the reason why we can do that is because they're still small enough that once they get bigger, I may be able to um, thin them out a little more or I'm going to test the limits of this plant. So first things first, I have my, my seedlings. And so I'm going to go in with my trowel at an angle. I want to get all the way under where these plants are growing because I don't want to disrupt their roots at all. Um, before I do that, though, I'm going to put some, some potting mix because they, these no longer need seedling mix. And you see, this was grown in seedling mix and it did just fine. So for me, I, I like to use seedling mix. I was testing it out to see if it, you know, what difference it really makes. Um, the, have, taking that particular care really comes in handy when you're growing crops for sale and you don't really have room for error. However, when you're at home and it, like, it's fun, it's experimentation, you're growing your own food, you can test the limits. And each year, as you do it more and more, you're going to learn more things. So I have some potting mix. Um, it says help these plants up to six months. Choosing your potting mix um, is a whole nother class. But in general, I don't want to get any type of potting mix that's been treated. I don't want to get any type of potting mix um, that has like chemical fertilizer in it. Even though it makes it easy for our crops to grow, I just, I don't want that. Uh, because for me, I'm all about naturally grown. I'm all about um, organic. Um, because that's, that's what I choose for myself. So I'm going to just take it out the pack. It's, it's pretty moist when it comes out. So if you're using potting soil that has been sitting at your house for a while, if you just kind of drench it down a little bit with um, with some water, not really drench it. You don't want to drench it, but you do want to water it and allow the moisture to be at about like a 30%, which means that it's moist to the touch, but not that you can, you don't want to be able to squeeze it um, and get water out. You just want to be able to feel the cool dampness of the mix. I'm sorry, what's it? What type of soil is this? So this is expert gardener potting mix, special formulated for indoor and outdoor container plants. This is not necessarily a recommendation, it's what I had on hand. This potty mix right here, I really love it. Um, the Coast of Maine potting, premium potting soil. It's a little bit more expensive though. So another kind of pro tip is you can mix these things together. So I have, I put some soil in my pot here. 
I don't have it still all the way up. I don't know if you can see that. Um, I'm going to mix in some of the potting soil that I love, which is a little bit fluffier. It has perlite in it. This is a really great time to, um, to go back to grandma wisdom and put some, crush up some eggshells and put it in there. So I'm going to use my trowel just to mix this in a little bit, the two different types that I have. And they look really different, so I'm just mixing until I see some uniformity in what this mix is looking like. Great, so now uh, every pot has a fill line. So I just fill the um, eggshells give, uh, give good calcium and protein to your plants. Um, so I have it filled up to the fill line just underneath because I'm going to add more soil. I think I'm going to add more soil now since these seedlings are so small. I'm going to add some more of the good stuff. Because I'm testing the limits, so I really want um, these plants to have the nutrients that they need. Because I'm going to put two tomato plants in here. So now that I have my soil all mixed together, it's in my pot, it's ready to go. I'm going to go back into my pot with my trowel at an angle, kind of like you're coring an uh, apple, that same kind of motion that you do. And I'm going to do that with these. Now that I have all of my plant stock out, I'm going to choose which of these seedlings I want to plant. So I'm just going to break this apart. And once I did that, I got four little plants all together. So I'm going to make my own little transplants here. So I separated it. I have my one seedling. I'm just going to press the soil together just to make it a little bit easier to put in there. Uh oh, I lost it. It played me off. Sorry. And I just want to show you guys right before I finish um, what's left in my pot. So I thin that out and I just put three plants in my pot. Um, and we're going to water this. This I did not put um, any rocks in the bottom, nor do I have a container, so I'm not going to. Oh, here we go. I didn't even bring no water. Um, but yes, that's it. And if you're looking for pots and you don't have pots around your house, things that you can use, mason jars, old yogurt containers. Um, a really good one are candles. So like that little last bit, put it in your oven, allow the, the wax to melt, pour it out, wash it out, and you have a beautiful glass jar that you can use um, for planting your seedlings in that um, won't really have kind of a whole bunch of toxins leaching out into it. Glass is a really great container to reuse. Um, so if you want to move to the next slide, it's only just asking y'all if y'all have any questions. Um, I have some resources in there that we can copy paste um, into the chat for more information about things I talked about today. But thank you all for, um, for being a great audience, and I wish you the best of luck um, with, your, with your gardens. <laughs>